Um, so what we do last time, we, last time we talked about um, simulation with constraints. And that kind of led us to talk a little bit about DAEs, differential algebraic equations, which is basically when you get ODEs plus you know, joint constraints or whatever, which shows up all the time in robotics applications when you simulate closed loop linkages and all kinds of stuff. So super, super common stuff. And then we talked about kind of the classical approach to simulating these things. If you've got one of these, you the standard standard thing to do that you'll see in just about um, every simulator, namely the one that does this, uh, that's very common is Pi Bullet actually uses this approach of like writing things down and, and with, with a bunch of joint constraints and using Baumgart stabilization. So it's, uh, it's one of the standard approaches. So now you know a little bit about how bullet pie bullet works under the hood. Um, so today we're gonna sort of switch gears a little bit and talk about kind of a pretty different approach. And this is this sort of variational integrator stuff. Which is kind of a, it's a theory for sort of deriving and studying integrators for mechanical systems for Lagrangian systems and sort of gives you a lot of insight into how these things work and why they work. And hopefully uh, we'll, you know, that'll elucidate some things, particularly about the implicit midpoint method and why it's magically so good at so many things like we've been seeing throughout the semester. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about momentum and what it actually is and all that good stuff. Then we're gonna talk about this thing called the Legendre transform. There's a lot of French names in this, subject. Uh, has anyone heard of this before? One person? Anybody else? Nobody else? So has anyone heard of like, uh, has anyone done an optimization talk about like a dual problem or a uh, Lagrange dual? So that's what this is basically. This is the mechanics version of that. We're going to talk about that today. Then we're going to talk about uh, a little bit Hamiltonian mechanics, which is the, the other big one in, you know, classically speaking. And uh, we'll sort of like show you what that is and whatever. And that's it's not so common in robotics. It's much more common in physics, um, but it's, it's really just the dual form of the Lagrangian setup. So we're gonna do that today. Um, I would say practically speaking, it doesn't really buy you anything over the Lagrangian setup. It's totally equivalent and sort of this dual thing. Okay, so let's do it. Um, so, variational integrators, which is where we left off last time. So these guys are um, specialized integrators. We saw like specialized in methods for Lie groups, for example, the RKMK things. Um, so the idea here is they're specialized to Lagrangian systems, which is a pretty broad class. So rather than thinking about generic x dot equals f of x, which is kind of the, the realm of Runge-Kutta methods where you basically are just looking at this continuous ODE function and trying to approximate its solution with polynomials in a very generic way. Here, we're gonna actually look at the Euler-Lagrange equation kind of directly and the Lagrangian directly. We're gonna try to approximate the Lagrangian and then derive. So the idea here is like before we, we wrote down x dot equals f of x, and we come up with a polynomial that sort of fits, approximates x of t. Here, what we're going to do is actually approximate the Lagrangian directly as a piecewise polynomial, and then plug that into the Euler-Lagrange equation. So we're getting the exact sort of Euler-Lagrange solution to an approximated Lagrangian, rather than getting sort of the uh, sort of approximate solution to an exact, you know, sort of Euler-Lagrange equation, if that makes sense. So it's like flipping this idea around. Okay, um, and yeah, so the, the key idea here is, is to approximate or discretize
um, the, the Lagrangian and or East action principle rather than the ODE. So in fact, in these methods, we never really get an ODE in the classical sense. Um, and then the, the cool thing about this, because we're doing this, so really the way to think about this is we approximate the, the, the Lagrangian, AKA the argument inside the, the action integral. We approximate that by a piecewise polynomial. Then for a piecewise polynomial, I can integrate it exactly and I can differentiate it exactly, right? So I can basically, for this approximate Lagrangian, now I can get you the exact solution over some time interval. That's, that's what's going on here. So if the system's conservative, all this other kind of stuff, because we're getting the exact solution to an approximate Lagrangian, we're gonna exactly conserve all of the conserved quantities that that approximated system would have, right? So like the one way to think about this, because, because it's exact solution to some Lagrangian, if that system's conservative, we're going to exactly conserve some approximation of the true energy, right? Some discretized approximation of the true energy, the true momentum, et cetera. So we, because of that, we carry over all of these nice conservation properties exactly. We're just conserving an approximation of the continuous time quantity, right? So what that means is, you know, the continuous quantity might wiggle around a little bit because it's an approximation, but it's not going to blow up on you or whatever. It's going to be Lyapunov stable by construction, basically. That's pretty cool. So in, so in addition to that, they, they also similarly obey all the constraints that you might have exactly. So you don't need the Baumgart stabilization stuff. You can just throw it all in there and basically solve a KKT system and get the answer exactly. So in particular, these have really nice stability properties and really good long-term sort of qualitative behavior, which means you can take big steps with them, which means they can be more efficient and you can do long-term simulations of things. So like if you're talking about doing, this might not be super common in, in a lot of robotics applications, but for like space missions, for example, where you're like flying to Mars and that takes a year and a half and you need to accurately simulate this thing, you know, out that far. If you do really long simulation horizons, this is a really good thing to have that lets you take big steps and kind of conserve all the energy stuff, right? So you get qualitatively good answers over long times. Okay, cool. So any questions about the setup? Yeah. So in this case, if you work with maximum coordinates, then wouldn't your conservation be dependent on how well you satisfy the In general, yeah, that's an issue, right? Here, what we're saying is by construction, these methods will exactly satisfy the constraint. So for the you still need the No, you do not. In this, this step, so the reason we needed that before, in continuous time, we basically like double diff the constraints and they're sort of in the KKT system we solve, they're only enforced at the acceleration level, right? So, but then your Lagrangian that you construct here would be the minimum No, no, you can do it in maximal coordinates and exactly satisfy the constraint. It's not clear yet, we'll have to do some stuff, but yeah, what I'm saying is, here, if you do the maximal coordinate thing with the joint constraints, you're guaranteed to exactly satisfy the, the joint constraints at each knot point. And so you like by construction, the methods sort of do the right thing. You don't need the Baumgart stabilization step here. They're sort of the setup is quite different, I guess. It's, and it'll become clear maybe later if we as we do stuff like what's going to happen there. So this is sort of the other way of dealing with joint constraints and stuff and avoid solving DAEs essentially, right? It's a slightly different setup. All right, any other questions? Cool. All right, so here's sort of how this works. And you, you know, I've sort of been teasing this stuff the whole time, so this shouldn't be too surprising. Um, you've seen like lots of hints. So if we start with this, the, the thing we all have seen a million times at this point, the action uh, integral. So we can take this guy and then I can do something right out the gate that's exact, that doesn't, that doesn't approximate anything. We're gonna break this thing into a bunch of tiny pieces.
Um, so this is not an approximation yet. So we're gonna do, again, min over, you know, I don't know, we can call it still to whatever, but we're gonna do, um, we're gonna break this into say n um, tiny segments, tk to t uh, k plus one, L Q T, right? So what I did so far is I just took that big integral and I broke it into a bunch of little integrals and summed over the little integrals. So that's not an approximation yet. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, oh, this is like, you know, that's a little tiny integral over just some tiny time step eight with length eight. So let's say uh, we have TK equals, you know, T naught plus K H, something like this. Um, now, because if we make these these h's you know sufficiently small, I can approximate those little integrals with a, what we call a quadrature rule. So, like a reasonable thing to do would be to use say like the um, so the integral from tk to tk plus one. L Q Q dot D T. Like what if you if you had to approximate this, like what would be a reasonable thing to do? What would you do? Trapezoid. Trapezoid's fine, yeah. Well uh what else? Anybody else have any other good ones? Sorry? Zero to hold. Yeah, zero to hold kind of thing. So there's a bunch of these. Do you know what this is called when we are numerically approximate an integral? So I've heard the word quadrature before, a numerical quadrature. That's gen in general, that's what it's called when you like, if I have some random integral I hand you and you wanna numerically approximate it, it's called quadrature. And it's very closely related to ODE solvers actually. It's very closely related to, related to like runge kutta method. In fact, you could do this with a runge kutta method with some tricks, but there's sort of specialized methods for handling this sort of problem. Um, and there's a whole theory and it's, it's pretty well developed and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to use instead of trapezoid, uh, we're going to use a, a slightly different one, which is just the uh, it's called the midpoint rule. Um, so it looks like you might expect. We're going to sort of average the Q's and the V's across the time step. So this is sort of the L at the midpoint of that interval and then times the time step, right? So this may be called the rectangle rule, although usually rectangle means the zero to hold thing, like you said, where it's, you evaluate the, uh, the L at the beginning of the interval. This is I'm evaluating at the midpoint. It turns out the classical rectangle rule, like zero to hold, like you said, that's only first order accurate. This is second order accurate. So a little better. And it, in general, you can actually plug in any polynomial for this that you want, and then evaluate L at a handful of points inside the interval. And then we know how to integrate polynomials exactly, right? So that's sort of just like the ODE thing. Basically what I do is I plug a polynomial in for L, fit it at a handful of points in the interval, and then exactly integrate the polynomial. And whatever order polynomial I use to do that is the order of accuracy of my quadrature rule. It's very similar to runge kutta methods, right? Cool. Um, okay, so this is, let's say, um, actually, Good point. And then this thing, the whole thing down here that approximates that little integral, we're going to call this the discrete Lagrangian. And we're going to notate it as LD of QK, QK plus one. So if you give me a, some QKs, some not points, I can plug it into this guy, the two not points, right? Like Schultz. I'm just gonna give me a, an approximation of that little integral of the integral of the Lagrangian over a, of a over a single time step, right? And yeah, if I like cartoon this out, the quadrature rule thing, what I'm getting is they have, you know, as a cartoony thing, we've got a like T L, right? So I have some some value here, and 
I'm evaluating the L's at these midpoints, right? And adding these guys up. You can think it's, you know, sort of similar to the like Riemann sum idea, right? That you probably learned in kind of basic calculus, whatever. Um, and what else do we say about this? It is called. Has anyone heard of like Gauss quadrature or Chebyshev quadrature? These these show up a lot in optimal control, numerical optimal control, and collocation methods. Have you heard of that? So I don't know. Fun. Um, I don't know. It's an old word. It's probably three hundred years old. It's probably from Latin. I don't know. That's a question for for Google. Um, and yeah, what else? There's there's a very um, well developed theory of these things. Um, very similar to Rangatata. where you have like order conditions and all this kind of stuff. And I can say I have a second order quadrature rule or a fourth order quadrature rule or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, when, when you kind of get rid of T dot, is that because it's like convenient just like the next part of the Yeah, so there's actually a few ways to do this and we're gonna get into this a little bit more today. Here, yeah, basically like the classic thing is I, in like this continuous case, right? I, I think about it as I'm optimizing over some Q of T trajectory. So here, same thing. Basically, what I'm going to do is discretize Q of T, and then I'm going to approximate everything in the least action problem with like discrete approximations, right? So here, I'm approximating Q dot by like that finite diff rule. It's a centered finite difference, right? So it's second order accurate. And then I'm approximating like the Q by the midpoint. So that's also a second order approximation. So the whole thing's second order. I can do other things also. So in particular, yeah, you can actually play some games and like, explicitly carry around velocities in various ways and maintain a Q of T and a V of T if you want to. And we're going to talk about that today. Does that sort of answer the question? Yeah. yeah. So there's, I mean, you can do whatever you want in general, and there's like lots of ways to do this. This is just the simplest way. So I'm going to show you that the simplest way first, and then we'll, we'll sort of like get a little trickier. One of the things though you're, you're right about here is that if I do it this way, there's some inherent ambiguity in defining the velocity. Because everywhere I do, if at the end of this, right, I'm going to get a Q of T. I'm going to get a bunch of QKs, right? How do I get the velocities out after my, say I simulate this thing a whole time series and I got some trajectory in terms of Qs. What if I want the velocity? Like, how do I get that? What if I have a PD controller and I need the velocity? Like, how do I get that? So you can get it at the midpoints by doing that, right? It's kind of like you also have the discrete approximation of the velocity. Yeah, exactly, right? And in particular, I have a midpoint approximation of the velocity. So when I do this, I get the Qs, the positions on the knot points, right, at the Ks. But if I use this kind of midpoint approximation, I get the Vs like offset half a time step, which is really annoying and does some weird things, right? There's essentially always like a half time step mismatch between the positions and the velocities, um, which can cause problems. In particular, if you're doing like a PD controller, um, there's like, often problems with time delays on the velocities and things like this, right? Like latency is going to do weird things. So we're going to talk about that a bunch more, actually. Like you basically what you would like to have is the Vs on the knot points, right? Just like the Qs. If you were doing a simulation, like we, we do with the normal Runge-Kata method, right? So there is a way to do that here. There's a couple ways actually. Okay, cool. So any other questions about any of this? All good? Okay. So Okay, so onward, what's next? So, so okay, so we approximated this, this little integral. And now if I kind of plug that back into my least action thing, I'm gonna get like a discrete action sum, right? The action integral turns into an action sum, not surprising. So now we've got min over Q one to N say of this discrete action guy. 
And this looks like sum from a equals one to n minus one, discrete Lagrangian evaluated at these guys, right? Okay, so this is now sort of with this setup, this looks exactly like the hanging cable, sort of discrete version of the hanging cable we did, right? So everything from here on is the same as the hanging cable stuff where we can find essentially KKT conditions of this guy that are local between a handful of knot points, just like before. Um, and we can get this sort of discrete Euler-Lagrange equation thing. So, let's write that down. There we got it by like drawing little pieces of cable or right, and do it, but we got the same exact kind of approximation. Here it's just a little more abstract where instead of the cable, it's the value of the Lagrangian over time, right? In that picture. But it's the same, same idea. Yeah. Yeah. So LD is literally that that this this whole thing here. It approximates the little integral, right? It's that, it's also the little. It's this square. It's one of these squares, right? It's specifically, it's the area of one of these squares, right? I evaluate L at the midpoint and then I multiply by H. So maybe I can write that down. This is H, right? Okay. All good? Cool. So same as the cable. Um, and then we can get the like sort of local optimality condition, KKT condition things. Um, so let's, I'll do it explicitly actually. Let's look at the, so when we did the cable, right? Remember we, we did the sort of like dynamic programming version where we zoomed in and looked at one little segment. So we'll do that here again. So say with only three knot points, right? And this is just me zooming in, right? And I, I can imagine always, if I have some trajectory, I can always look at a tiny chunk of the trajectory, right? Like this. And so if I did that, it's sort of done out explicitly, I'm gonna get sort of this guy evaluated at say Q1, Q2, plus this guy evaluated at Q2, Q3. And if I take this guy's derivative, remember the endpoints are held constant. We take the derivative of the stuff in the middle. So I just take the derivative with respect to Q2. And it's the same thing as the chain where I'm assuming like the endpoints are fixed on the chain, right? And I want to find the shape of the chain. It's the exact same thing here. Um, this is more like I assume I know the endpoints of the trajectory and I look for the stuff in the middle, but I can do this, right? And then what comes out of this is in our notation we had before, this is uh, sorry, D2 of this guy plus D1 of this guy has to equal zero. And this thing is what we're going to call the discrete Euler Lagrange equation. And we did this before, right? with the chain. And now basically this thing, I minimized this with respect to Q2 before, but now that I have this condition, I can solve this any direction I want. So if I have, Q1 and Q2, say, I can plug those two in and solve this guy for Q3. Or if I have Q2 and Q3, I can plug those in and solve this for Q1, right? Like I can just use this equation as, this is basically an implicit equation that links three time steps together. So given any two time steps, I can solve for the third one and it doesn't matter which way I go, right? Does that make sense everybody? 
Cool. So, that's exactly right. Yeah. So this is called the slot derivative notation. And it's uh, the reason I do it here is because I need to keep track of these time step arguments. So if I just did like partial L partial or whatever, it's a little awkward. This lets me more easily keep track of, of the arguments of the functions that I'm differentiating. But yeah, it's just notation for partial respect to first argument, second argument, whatever. Cool. Any other questions? Good. All right. Let's see. What do we say about this? Um, yeah. So this is basically an implicit integrator now, right? In fact, you can show that because all this stuff, we did polynomials, right, blah, blah, blah. This is actually just an implicit runga kata method. And in particular here, it's a second order implicit runga kata method, right? So what do we think this actually is? It's like, it's, well, so we did a lot of second order runga kata methods, right? Remember there was like explicit midpoint, there's, you know, there's various other ones. But this is a very particular one. So we, we know it's implicit, right? And we're using midpoint approximations and a second order thing, right? So what if, if you had to guess, what do you think this is? It turns out this is exactly equivalent to the implicit midpoint method that we've already seen. So you remember how we were looking at implicit midpoint before? It had all these interesting like special properties. It seemed like it conserved energy and it had like this A stability property that was really nice. That meant it, you know, didn't do weird energy things and sort of stayed stable. This is why implicit midpoint is so good in some in these qualitative. It's because it's a variational integrator. So it turns out people had found instances of these special um, integrators that conserved energy and stuff like this over the years, dating back to like 50 years, maybe people had found these things randomly. And it wasn't until the early 2000s when this variational integrator theory was developed that people could explain why they worked. People had just found a few of them and they were out there in the literature for years, implicit midpoint being one of them, but there are other ones. People like just stumbled onto them. And then like early 2000s, this theory basically explains why they work and it gives you a way to construct new ones. So if I wanted, you know, before there were just these random ones people had found, tended to be low order, et cetera. But now you have a method for, I can make one of any order I want now, right? I can plug in a polynomial to that integral, turn the crank, get something like this, in fact, it just, it's really all it is, is I use some approximation for the discrete Lagrangian here. It's just this equation. I can make whatever LD I want, right? So this is like a systematic way of, of deriving these things now. Uh, okay, cool. So So right, given Q1, Q2. Okay, so, and here you would do this using Newton's method, right? As, as before. Yeah. So it's also like higher order, uh, like an integrator, I mean, you need more iterations yeah so you can absolutely do with use derivatives at the endpoint step that turns out to be kind of messy but you can absolutely do it um yeah so for example you could use cubic splines right and do something like that but the more standard way is to use a bunch of points in the middle and that's actually equivalent to what the run of methods do right so that's kind of more the standard thing there's a whole bunch of quadrature rules uh, that you can use here the next one up to do would be Simpson's rule, right? And so there you use a point in the middle and you get a third order approximation, right? So you can do that um, next. So generally speaking, right? So then what you'd get maybe here is, um, there's a few ways of thinking about it. Basically you could imagine these guys then become functions of, you know, three Qs and you'll get an extra optimality condition where it has to be optimal with respect to the one in the middle as well. So you'll get like this condition plus sort of, conditions for inside the intervals if you do all the derivatives out or you can just kind of bake it in like this and, and actually handle it inside LD and like take care of optimizing over the midpoint internally so it's sort of like you can think about it as a few different ways like also that way you can think about it just nesting what I did here right recursively so there's a few ways but yeah absolutely it's basically like the standard thing is just take a bunch of points in the interval to fit whatever polynomial approximation you want 
and then you solve an you can solve an inner minimization over that, and then this guy just sort of relates endpoints on those splines right together, or you can write out the inner minimization conditions along with these endpoint matching conditions to get a list of where you'd essentially get one row of, of sort of KPT type conditions for each internal point as well, right? And then jointly solve it, but whatever. All right, anything else? Yeah, we're gonna do that actually. That's a fun story. So that's coming today, I promise. Okay, cool. So let's, um, let's look at an example where we'll do this. So this should work. Okay. Yeah, I see this all right. Make this bigger. You guys need to make it a little bigger, maybe. Is that okay? Okay, so here's our, our pendulum thing. We're gonna compute a reference solution. This is like the, the you know, classic stuff F equals MA, and we're gonna use kind of the standard ODE toolbox with a nice variable step stuff. And let's say we just do it for like 10 seconds. This will take a sec. Keep plot. Blah, blah, blah. This is one of the one of the annoying things about Julia is that the plotting takes a really long time the first time. Okay, cool. So there's no surprises there. Uh, pendulum. Okay, so now I'm going to write out all the energy stuff, right, for our Lagrangian. So kinetic energy, potential energy, just the stuff we've seen before, no surprises. One half mv squared, you know, mg times the height, whatever. Um, now I'm going to plot the total energy for the simulation we just did. And you can see, you know, it's, it's fine, but it, it wiggles around a bunch. And in, in particular, over the long term, it's decreasing. And if I did something like, say, if I turn this up to uh, 100 seconds, say, you can pretty clearly see now the trend here where this is, you can see it's damping out a little bit, right? The wiggles are getting smaller. And if I plot the energy, you can really clearly see the trend now. The energy is really decreasing over time, right? In this reference. So this is with, by the way, an adaptive step Runge-Kutta method. That's like a fourth, fifth order runga cut a pair, right? It's an advanced adaptive step integrator. If I crank down the integrator tolerances a whole bunch, so let me crank these down to like, say one E minus six. So it gets better, but you can still see right now it's, it's still losing energy. It's just doing it slower, right? So now the energy loss is out at four decimal places or something over this hundred second simulation, but this isn't going away. I can make those tolerances as tight as I want. This is always going to be there. In fact, it's an inherent property of the Runge Kata method that I'm using. Remember, we looked at like Lyapunov stability, these methods before and all this kind of stuff, and how, say, Euler, you know, artificially adds energy, backward Euler artificially damps. Turns out RK4 very slightly artificially damps as well. And it's just part of the part of the integrator. So like these things don't do nice things automatically for you. And no matter what I do, this is this is going to happen, right? Um, so like if I want to simulate for a long time or I want to take really big steps here, right? If I take big steps, it's actually really bad. If I go back to like the default tolerances, it's actually, you know, quite visibly damped with default tolerances. So this is pretty terrible and it's losing crap load of energy, right? Like super visible. So, you know, this stuff again, sanity check, blah, 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 but you know, they don't do nice things for you out, uh, automatically out of the box and you have to be careful. So what we'll do now is, is the variational method. So here's like this, uh, we define the Lagrangian right here. We define this discrete Lagrangian using these midpoint approximations, like we said before. Um, so H times the midpoint thing. And then I write down here my discrete Euler Lagrange equation, which again, remember it's three time steps in a row and it's the derivative of this guy with respect to the second argument evaluated at Q1, Q2. And then the derivative of this guy with respect to the first argument, evaluate Q2 and Q3, right? So this is exactly what we wrote down. I'm using forward diff to get the derivatives. Straightforward, right? Okay, so now we're gonna do the simulation. So I'm gonna actually cheat here. I'm gonna steal Q1 and Q2 out of my reference solution by evaluating the reference solution at the sort of first two time steps, which again is cheating, right? Like 
if I were given the initial conditions of this thing um, in terms of Q and V or whatever, this is weird. And I'd have to come up with a way to do this. And we're going to get into this a little bit. There's some, the way I wrote this down right now, it's not obvious how to initialize one of these guys because I need two consecutive Qs. So you can imagine using some other integrator to get Q2, but that's sort of weird and ugly. That's what I did here, but I, we don't in general want to do that. So we're going to like talk more about this, but here we'll do it for now. So I'm, I'm plugging Q1, Q2 from the reference solution. Then here's my Newton's method thing. Basically, I'm going to evaluate the, the discrete Euler Lagrange equation. I'm going to take an initial guess of QK plus one equals QK. Evaluate this guy. It's not going to be zero. I'm going to get some residual. Then I'm going to do Newton's method here where I evaluate the derivative of this guy with respect to Q3, right? And then I set up kind of the standard Newton's method where I get this correction where I take the Jacobian inverse times the residual and I update QK plus one. And then I evaluate the residual again and I loop this until the residual is driven down to like 20 minus 12. So until basically, you know, numerical tolerances, blah, blah, blah. Now we're going to plot these on top of each other. So this looks interesting. So um, the blue is the, the variational one. And you can see it's not damped, right, like the other one is. So we plot the total energy of this guy. Uh, here we go. And we compare. So that's pretty interesting. So the stock Runge kind of method, super damped, right? It's like losing all kinds of energy. This variational guy is flat. So it's conserving energy, which seems nice. If we zoom in a little bit, there's some more interesting stuff we can see. So remember before I like cranked down on the tolerances on this guy and it got a little better. So let's do that. I'm gonna take smaller steps. Let's go right to the, the super tiny steps that we did before. So 1e e minus six. So this is pretty good, you know, still though decreasing a little bit, wiggling around a bunch. We go to our discrete version. Now they match really well, right? With the tighter tolerances. Now, if I plot the energy, uh, you can see, so this guy is still, it's pretty good, but you can see that it's, it's decreasing over time. This guy's wiggling around a whole bunch at the like fourth or fifth decimal place, but it's not, it's sort of not damped at all. It's staying constant. So we can say this guy's Lyapunov stable, right? Over a long, long time, it'll wiggle around a little bit, but it's not gonna go anywhere sort of in a, in a sort of long-term sort of way. Uh, okay, so that's that. And it turns out as I mess with the time step, one of the cool things about these methods, I can make the time steps huge actually, and I'll still get like good long-term energy behavior. So I can do like 10 Hertz time steps, say. Um, so it wiggles around still, but it's not doing, uh, it's still like Lyapunov stable. So it lets you take really big steps. Uh, okay. Any questions about this? Cool. Okay. Let's go back. Yep. Uh, so in this case, we have to do a Newton step to calculate what you see. That's right. Because we're doing a smart way of discretizing the Lagrangian, can we get away with doing a big order for that? Or maybe like basically like Euler, like it is. Yeah, so it turns out you, you totally can. Um, you can use a sort of first order hold rectangle rule approximation. You'll get a first order integrator now instead of a second order integrator. You'll still get all the nice conservation properties. The first order in energy or first order? It's first order in its accuracy in, in Q of T. Uh, in, in the same sense as the Runge-Kata methods we looked at, like it'll match the exact solution up to first order in, in a Taylor expansion. Does that make sense? It'll still conserve energy in the long run, but it'll only match the Q of T with first order accuracy. This one matches with second order accuracy. It turns out in general, these variational integrators will end up being implicit. And there's kind of hints at why when we talked about Runge-Kata methods and stability and all that stuff, I mentioned briefly, I didn't really prove it, but you can prove that you can't have an A-stable Runge-Kata method that's explicit. It has to be implicit to get it to be A-stable. And based on this sort of energy stuff, essentially any method that conserves energy in this way has to be A-stable. Like it can't artificially damp, right? If it's got the same stability properties as a continuous system. So essentially because of, that's a roundabout way of saying it, because these things 
have these nice energy conservation properties, they're they're generally a stable, and you can't have an explicit a stable on your counter method from a stability standpoint. So I don't know. That's a roundabout way of saying it. Here, basically, all of these variational methods end up being implicit Runge-Kutta methods. They're always equivalent to some implicit Runge-Kutta methods. It's just that they're very special implicit Runge-Kutta methods that you derive this way instead of kind of more standard ways, right? And here, like when we do normal Runge-Kutta, it's sort of hard to figure out how to set up the. You can kind of prove that it meets the order conditions for a given order, but deriving a specific method of a specific order is kind of weird and hard and it's ambiguous. Here it's really straightforward. I plug in a polynomial approximation of L into like the definition of LD, turn the crank and I get a runga kata method of that order that respects all the constraints and conserves energy and all this kind of stuff automatically by construction. So it's like slightly more than just a second order asymmetric because beyond just being a second order, beyond approximating up to the second order, also yeah, it's a much more than a generic runga kata method. These conservation properties and, and all this are very special, and they come from this variational setup where I derive it from the Euler Lagrange equation, kind of in discrete time. So I'm approximating the solution in a different place, right? Here I approximate at the level of the Lagrangian, and then I actually plug that into the Euler Lagrange property stuff, right? Whereas in the standard stuff, I say I have a Lagrangian, I plug the, I do it with the continuous Euler Lagrange equation, get x dot equals f of x, and then I'm approximating x of t with a polynomial, right? So I'm, I'm plugging the polynomial approximation in different places here versus the standard Runge Kata method. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, these still technically, these variational integrators are still Runge Kata methods, right? Like basically everything's a Runge Kata method in some sense, right? They are, all a Runge Kata method means is that I'm approximating the solution to an ODE with a polynomial, with a piecewise polynomial, right? Essentially, I'm approximating with some like spline, basically, is what Runge Kata methods are. So here I'm doing that too, right? I'm, I'm using a polynomial, piecewise polynomial approximation. So, like, technically, these are Runge Kata methods, and I can actually analyze them the same way as standard Runge Kata methods, but there's a lot more structure here. Does that make sense? So, all, all variational integrators are implicit Runge Kata methods. The you know converse is not true, right? There's special run of methods. Anyone else have anything? Cool. Okay, let's go back and write some notes. Okay, so let's see, what is there to say about the pendulum thing? So let's see, um, energy like oscillates about the true value. So you can prove these things are Lyapunov stable. And what else? Um, interestingly, right, this energy behavior is independent of the step size. So you can take really big steps with these methods and it won't do crazy things, which is kind of nice. So these are very good in, as a result for long-term simulations. Uh, what else? So it turns out here, right, accuracy is second order, unsurprisingly. And you can do other orders very easily. In general, accuracy of the um, the quadrature rule that you use for LD. Is equal to the accuracy of the resulting integrator, as a, like as a Runge Kutta method, right? In the classic Runge Kutta sort of sense. So that's easy. 
to, so therefore it's like really easy to construct higher order methods and stuff. All right, cool. Any questions about any of this stuff? Good, yeah. So the order of accuracy in the classic Rangakata sense is not higher, right? This is second order accurate. So if you're, if you're talking about like the exact solution over some interval, like if I give you X naught and I ask you to simulate it for 10 seconds, and I use like a fourth order Rangakata method with the same step size as this, the deviation of that, you know, X of T over 10 seconds will be less with RK4, right? But if I ask you to simulate it for a year and I use the same step size with RK4 in this, RK4, because of that energy behavior, is going to just blow up and do insane things uh, after you simulate long enough, whereas this will give you still qualitatively reasonable answers. And this is the yeah, the energy, energy, momentum, all those things, right? So another way to think about this is energy is some scalar constant, right? So for some conservative system, um, it's a constraint basically, right? Energy equals whatever value that the true trajectories are supposed to obey, right? So you can think about that as like a surface in the state space. Like it defines some sub-manifold, right? Some, some like, does that make sense? Kind of, sort of. So you can imagine like the energy energy equals some value is defining some surface, right? In, in the state space. And the true solution is supposed to lie on that surface. With generic Rungakata methods, what we're kind of saying is because of these weird energy behaviors, it's going to drift off the surface, right? So what, one way to think about this is the, these variational methods are automatically keeping you on the correct energy manifold, whereas the classic Rungakata methods are not, right? So like you can think about the standard Rungakata methods, they can be higher order, which means they're keeping you closer to the nominal X of T, but they're not necessarily keeping you on the energy manifold. So they might be closer in terms of absolute distance to X of T over a short horizon, but they might be off the energy manifold, right? Whereas this guy might be technically farther away from the true X of T, but it's going to be on the correct energy manifold still, right? So over a long time, it's kind of better to be on the correct energy manifold than to be notionally closer to the true trajectory because um, over a long enough time, if you drift off the energy manifold, you're getting stuff that's qualitatively wrong and just stupid looking, where it's gonna like go nuts on you and blow up. Whereas this thing will still give you the sort of qualitatively right answer, uh, right? Where it's like, it might not be sort of tracking the true X of T, but it's like in, it's sort of still like doing the qualitatively right thing. And usually that's more important. Over long term, yeah. Yeah, so probably not, honestly. But this stuff, even so, the times that matter sort of relative to the system, right? So, here I showed you on a simple pendulum, though. This happens in like time scales of a minute. You can see qualitatively pretty, pretty weird behavior going on in the standard Rungakata method. It, granted, you can take smaller time steps, blah, blah, blah. But what I'm saying is like this, these variational things. I don't really have to care about the time step. I can take really big steps and still get qualitatively correct answers. Whereas in the Rungakata methods, I have to maybe shrink the step size down and play around with it a little bit to get something that doesn't look stupid, even over time scales of minutes, right? So that's one nice thing about these things. Um, there's actually other reasons that these are much better. And in particular, the, the stuff we talked about before about constraints, the story here with constraints is much nicer. Basically, you don't have to do the Baumgart stabilization stuff and worry about that. And so they automatically satisfy constraints and um, they satisfy them exactly at every time step. So the, the, I would argue the real nice use case for these in robotics is for constrained systems and also for systems with contact, which we haven't gotten into yet, but this, this generalizes really nicely to constraints and contact constraints in particular in ways that the classical stuff does not. So in my opinion, this is like the way to simulate contact, which we're gonna do hopefully soon. So that's kind of why we're getting 
into this. So yeah, maybe on their own, if you're just simulating a smooth system in minimal coordinates, not a big deal. And maybe this isn't like a big deal, but if you're simulating something in maximal coordinates with a bunch of joint constraints and you're doing anything with intermittent contact and friction and stuff, this I would say is the way to go. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you know what the um, I mean, this is, these are about the same as any implicit Runge-Kata method. Right. And so it depends really on the situation, but um, they're not going to be super far off from any other like high order run kind of method. Basically, one way to think about this is like you have to do this iterative Newton solve with an implicit method versus an explicit method where you're just evaluating F a bunch of times. But that's actually like generally speaking, just a constant factor more expensive. So it's, it's like as if you're using a higher order RK method, you know, so something like that, right? Like this might be more expensive than RK4, but it's not dramatically so it's big O it's the same it'll just have a bigger constant out front it's not a big deal and you can make up a lot of that in being able to take bigger steps and not having to mess around with constraint stabilization crap and things like this and the answers you get will be more accurate so in, in, this matters a lot more when you get to contact actually like here you'll get like qualitatively correct contact physics where you're not like sinking through the ground and all kinds of weird crap that happens in, in simulators like Mujoko. So this is kind of the real reason we're doing this. That makes sense. So it's going to take us a while to tell that story. All right, everybody good? Okay, here we go. Yeah. So usually, right, like when we say order of accuracy and stuff, it's it's accuracy in terms of H, right? It's like order, order uh, of a polynomial in H. So it's telling you like when, when we talk about order with runge kata methods, right? It's, it's really saying how much faster the solution gets better as I shrink H, right? So with the first order method, if I chop H in half, the solution gets twice as good. With the second order method, if I chop H in half, it gets one half squared as good. So it gets four times as better, right? And if I chop it in half with a fourth order method, it gets better by a factor of, you know, that to the fourth power, right? So as I shrink H, the higher order the method is, the, the like better the accuracy gets in terms of the time step. Does that make sense? Yeah, in general with classical methods, the smaller H is, the more accurate the solution is. Absolutely, yeah. So what we're saying here is, and then often, right, like when I, with the classical method, when I, when I crank down the tolerances, the energy behavior got better, right? But what I'm saying here is this, the conservation properties, like the conservation of energy and all this other stuff is independent of the step size. So these guys, with, if I make H really big in general, the solution's less accurate, right? With a classical method though, if I make H really big, not only will the solution be inaccurate, but like it'll do stupid things qualitatively speaking, like it'll become unstable when the true system is actually stable and, and all this kind of stuff, right? Here, it doesn't matter how big I make the time steps, it'll still conserve energy, it'll still have the same stability properties as the true system, et cetera, et cetera, right? So what this means is I can take big steps and not really worry about the time steps and I'll still get reasonable answers that won't do insane things, right? So they're much sort of like safer and more benign in some sense. Exactly, right. That's exactly right. So I don't have to, basically with a classical method, right, if I have like a stiff equation or I have like something that's, you know, whatever, I can, I can end up with time steps. Like if I make the time step bigger, it might become unstable. It might like do totally nuts things and blow up. Here, basically what we're saying is it's not going to blow up. It'll do reasonable things. It'll like still qualitatively look like the real system. It'll stay on the energy manifold, blah, blah, blah. It just might not be, it, it won't match the true trajectory as closely as if you made H smaller, but it won't, won't do insane stuff. That sort of, cool. Anybody else? Okay, moving on. Here we go. So now we're gonna talk about um, momentum and stuff. So let's see. Um, what do I call this here? Uh, we'll call this momentum, et cetera. This is a long conversation. So um, 
here we go. So, so like the reason we're kind of motivating this by is like before I needed Q1 and Q2 to initialize this thing, and that's kind of weird. And I would rather give it initial conditions in terms of like Q and Q dot or whatever position velocity, the, the normal thing, right? The normal state. So that's a bit awkward. Um, and we don't want that. So we want to say, how do we, it's kind of the first thing that we want to get at. And then sort of more broadly, like, um, how do we get, you know, how do we get the actual VK, VKs instead? And then kind of remember the the velocities we're using right now in the finite diff approximation are midpoint, not at the not points. And that's there's sort of this half time step mismatch that's going to potentially cause us problems. Okay, so let's sort of get into this. So we're going to sort of like take a step back and go back to continuous time land and do some theory for a bit to sort of get at this. Um, so the starting point here is this kind of trivial rewriting of the least action principle. Seems trivial at least, uh, but it goes a little deeper. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, we're going to explicitly introduce a velocity. So we have now min over QT VT. Um, and the T naught to T final thing. And now it's just going to be L of QV instead of QQ dot. And we're going to introduce a constraint that says Q dot equals V. And we're going to call this a, like a kinematic constraint. Um, so this is actually much more interesting than meets the eye. It turns out one of the things this lets you do is define other less trivial kinematics constraints. So when might we do that? Anyone have any ideas? When might I not want my velocities to equal my Q dots? Yeah, so if I do rotations, I might have my Qs be a quaternion or a rotation matrix, and I want my Vs to be omega, angular velocity, right? So those are different things. They're different sizes, and I would maybe put the quaternion kinematics in here, right? So this is actually what you have to do to get the Euler-Lagrange equation from something like this. There's other scenarios, too, where you might want those things to be totally different, where you might want to have, like, Vs that are totally different from just your Q dots. So this lets you do that very explicitly. If anyone's heard of Keynes equations, this is how you get Keynes equations. You plug in an arbitrary affine function here to map q dot and v. And if you plug it in and turn the crank, you'll get out Keynes equations, basically, which lets you do that. Um, I don't know. There's a, so there, there's good reason to do this, basically. One thing we didn't kind of quite talk about yet is that the standard Euler Lagrange, like Lagrangian mechanics setup, explicitly requires you to have your velocities equal q dot, right, as part of the deal. So actually, you can't derive the Euler equation for rigid body dynamics from the Euler-Lagrange equation. It doesn't work. Um, so you have to go up a level and do something like this. OK, cool. So we got this. Um, now what we're going to do is enforce the kinematics constraint with a Lagrange multiplier in kind of the normal way.
And I'm going to sort of write out then the, the sort of first order necessary conditions and like in a sort of suggestive way, I guess. So we're going to get, say, partial with respect to Q of T of T naught to T final, um, L of QV plus Lagrange multiplier, which I'm going to call P, and then the Q dot minus V, you know, kinematic constraint, that's supposed to equal zero, DT. So this thing's got to equal zero. And then similarly, partial respect to V of T of the same thing has to equal zero. Right. So those are my first order necessary conditions, right? Gradient with respect to all the decision variables F equals zero. And also technically speaking, right? Also gradient with respect to the Lagrange multiplier, which just gives me back the original constraint also has to equal zero, right? So I'd also get Q dot minus V equals zero. Um, Okay, so now let's um, do the standard. If we sort of do the standard integration by parts, you know, calculus of variations tricks on this, um, we get the following things. So actually, yeah, can anyone tell me what we get on the first one? If I do this and do like my standard tricks, what's it going to turn out to be? The my like Euler-Lagrange equation. The first term's easy. It's going to be like partial L, partial Q, right? Then what about the next term? What's going to happen over here? Sorry? No, because there's a Q dot here, right? Remember? So this is where I have to play that integration by parts trick. Does anyone remember what happens when I do this? Nobody remembers. There's a standard, the standard trick, the heuristic trick is what I do, right? Is I want to get this to be a Q, not a Q dot. And there's a trick that says I can I can flip the dot and pick up a minus sign. This is integration by parts, right? It's the it's the product rule run backwards. We did this a couple of times before. So I don't want to do the whole thing out again. That's in the like previous. So if I do that, I'm gonna get um, partial L, partial Q. And then this guy, right? I'm going to get the dot goes over here, and then this is just a Q. So then partial is just the P dot now, right? And I pick up a minus sign. So this is minus P dot equals zero. And then similarly, if I do partial expected V, what do I get? So I got partial L, partial V. And then what about over here? Just just P, right? Cool. And it picks up, it's, it's minus P, right? Cool. So partial L, partial V minus P equals zero. You do? So we did this a, a few lectures ago. So what happens to the constant terms? Can I remember? So they end up being endpoint terms at the two endpoints at T non and T final. And we argue that the endpoints are fixed. So those endpoint terms are zero and they drop out. That's sort of, we did this when we did the cable and, and whatever. I think we did it one other time as well. Okay, so we get these conditions. Um, so now um, here's sort of a fun, fun, and we also still have right the, the Q dot equals V. So this is the full set of KKT conditions for this guy, right? So now let's plug in. Um, let's plug in L equals sort of the standard, say, one half MV squared uh, minus. So what happens uh, to the first one? Sorry? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, so what happens when I take partial L partial Q here? It's minus del U, right? So this is the force, right, from the potential. So this is just like F, basically. 
And then this is um, so this is equals p dot, right? So this is f equals ma. So this is f equals ma. How about the other one? What does the other one do? So when I do partial L, partial V, what's that equal? MV. And this says MV equals P. So what does this tell us? Yeah, so it tells us that the Lagrange multiplier that I introduced to enforce the kinematics is actually the, the momentum of the system. So this is like a deep thing, actually. Basically, like, when you talk about momentum in general, like what it is in sort of a deeper sense, it's actually this Lagrange multiplier that's associated with enforcing the kinematics constraint in the order of the Lagrange equation. So this is like actually the right way to derive momentum and stuff like that. In general, we know it's like MV or whatever in some sense, but like if you do some weird stuff where you've got like really complicated coordinates and you're using different velocities from your Q dots and all kinds of stuff, this is like in general how to get momentum. Yeah. Uh, let's say you said it was forced. I said what was forced? Well, it depends on what, what it's enforcing. Okay. So it's force if it's a joint constraint. It can be lots of things depending on the context, right? In economics, they're called shadow prices. In optimal control, it's the cost to go function, right? That's telling it's the gradient of the cost to go. Like depends on the context, right? So if I'm enforcing a joint constraint, it, it turns out it's a force. If I'm enforcing a kinematics uh, constraint here, where I'm telling you like how the velocities uh, of my, you know, configuration coordinates, how my velocities are related to the derivatives of my, my cues or whatever. In this context, it, take, it turns out it takes on, I mean, you can also think about it from units matching, right? So like these guys have units of velocity, whereas before um, when I was doing the joint constraints, those had units of position. So the multiplier has to have different units to make it match up with the units of action or whatever the units of Lagrangian, which are energy units, right? So just from dimensional arguments, you can kind of see it's gotta be something else, but it turns out, yeah, in this case, it's momentum. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, let's see. So what did we say about this? Um, so this is sort of saying, <clears throat> that's fun. Um, okay, so has anyone seen this before? Yeah. Um, so what we have, I forget what it's called, like the type of collision that you deal with, so that yeah. they're meant to still be conserved, but it's not like a force of this. So I don't think that you, when you have collisions between particles, uh, you can talk about the total momentum of the system being conserved. If you're talking about um, collisions with the ground, I don't think it is conserved. Uh, but yeah, the collisions are weird. And like, let's put that off for a little bit still. Uh, any other questions about this? Kind of weird, kind of interesting. Okay, so uh, what is there to say about this? Uh, so anyone seen anything like this before? Probably not, this is weird. So this thing, um, actually this is basically fleshing out the story of, I told you a few times ago where I sort of said that the um, least action principle was like equivalent to an optimal control problem or a trajectory optimization problem. This is actually that, right? This is exactly what I did when I said that. I said, you think about the, the Vs as control inputs and my dynamics constraints are this trivial like single integrator thing. So this is just that. Um, so this is the optimal control perspective, if you like, on, on dynamics. So this version of the least action principle with the explicit velocities and like this constraint, kinematics constraint, this is called the, uh, so you remember least action is called Hamilton's principle sometimes. This is called the hamilton Pontryagin principle because of the connection to optimal control. And because this basically, it turns out that this set of KKP conditions here with the P's 
is actually equivalent to the Pontryagin minimum principle and optimal control is the same, same stuff, right? Unsurprisingly. Um, so yeah, fun fact. Um, okay, cool. So let's see. So far, so good. So now we're going to play another trick that I think I'll have time to get through. So what we're going to do now is play a little change of variables kind of trick. I'm going to take, so now I have this P, right? And But in the, all these equations up here, I have a mix of like P's and V's, right? And in some sense, um, like, P and V, like they are uniquely determined from each other. So long as M is full rank and all that kind of stuff, right? But M, we generally say it's got to be symmetric, positive, definite. So it's invertible and all that good stuff, right? The mass matrix. So, so in general, right, I can like solve this for either P or V any way I want. And I don't need both of them, right? I can like sort of pick one or the other. So what we're going to do now is we're going to solve this guy for, we're going to basically plug in P's everywhere and, and get rid of all the velocities. So we can replace V with P if we want to. So we're, we're in particular, right, what I mean by this is we're going to say, you know, we have this already, this, um, you know, partial L partial V is equal to M uh m, m of q in general right so i can sort of turn this around and say v equals m inverse p and i can plug this in to the least action thing i can say you know so this is what i started out with right so let's see p q dot minus v so this is the full thing, right? With a multiplier and everything, as I originally sort of did it. I can sort of plug in, plug this in for all the Vs in this expression and rework this a little bit and I'll get the following thing. So I'm gonna get one half P transpose M inverse P minus U, that didn't change, right? And then the constraint is gonna look like um, so like basically what I'm going to do, right, this is going to turn into like an M inverse P. Uh, I subtracted that over here. Oh, what did I, actually I'll write it all the way out. We'll do it and then it should be more clear. Okay. So this, I literally just plugged everything in. So the next move is, this is a, this is P transpose M inverse P with a minus on it. This is one half P transpose M inverse P with a plus on it. If I take this and subtract it from here, I'm gonna get a minus one half, right? P transpose. So this is minus one half minus U and then the constraint just becomes P transpose Q dot, the constraint term, right? Okay, so far so good. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna make some stuff up. We're gonna call this guy here, the Hamiltonian. So this guy is a function of Q and P, and it's gonna be one half P transpose M inverse P uh, plus U. 
So, right, this was our kinetic energy. So you can think about this as just kinetic plus potential rather than kinetic minus potential, right? So this is typically the total energy rather than, but it's in particular, this is a function of Q and P rather than Q and V, like the Lagrangian, right? Um, and so in particular, right, Now the least action thing is S equals T naught to T final minus H QP plus P transpose Q dot. Cool. So far so good. Yeah. So here, yeah, that's no, it's negative. Uh, so it was T minus U before, right? From the, it's the Lagrangian. It's kinetic minus potential. So that never changed. I never touched the potential, right? I changed the velocity stuff. So I picked up a minus sign on this guy because of the constraint stuff. I pulled the constraint stuff over. So that stays the same. So now I end up with. This Hamiltonian, I'm going to define it here such that it's this is minus the Hamiltonian now, right? Cool. So, in terms of this new set of variables, so basically what I did is I eliminated all the V's and now I only have Q's and P's, right? And I've defined this Hamiltonian thing. So now I can do the usual thing um, and get KKT conditions, but now in these QP variables and in terms of this Hamiltonian thing, I'm going to do the exact same thing I did before, right? Where I just diff everything. So we're going to do partial respect to Q of T of this guy. Um, actually, yeah, we can we can sort of pull a minus sign out of the whole thing, and it doesn't matter, right? So we'll write it this way. And similarly, partial respect to P of this thing equals zero. And if I do that, what am I going to get? So here I'm going to get partial H, partial Q. What's going to happen here? I'm going to flip the dot, pick up a minus sign with my integration by parts trick. So I'm going to get partial H, partial Q, and then it's going to be plus P dot equals zero. I'm going to get partial H, partial P um, minus Q dot equals zero. So these guys, just like this, are the celebrated Hamilton's equations of Hamiltonian mechanics. Okay, so um, has anyone ever seen this before? Question one. Yeah. Yeah, it basically I eliminated it because I did this change of variables, right? So now I only have P and Q. I don't have, like before I needed the constraint because I had these separate, you know, Q dot and V and P floating around. I basically eliminated some of those variables. So I got rid of the constraint essentially, right? So when you that Versus in particular, this, this formulation up here, maybe, but honestly the constraint is kind of trivial. So it's, it's not a big deal. Um, so maybe. Um, the real reason why this is a big thing is in physics, it turns out that this setup with the Hamiltonian is really easy to generalize. It generalizes in a very straightforward way to quantum mechanics, but the Lagrangian setup is really hard to generalize to quantum mechanics. Uh, so FYI, but in, in general, like in classical mechanics, they're totally equivalent and it's not a really big deal. And there's no particular advantage of one over the other, I would say. But um, has anyone seen like this idea where I kind of like took a Lagrange multiplier and then like eliminated some of the primal variables and wrote it, rewrote the optimization in terms of the 
in terms of the Lagrange multiplier, aka dual variable. Has anyone seen this before? So what is this called in optimization? It's the dual problem, right? And in general, if it was a minimization, the dual problem is a max, right? So actually that's what's going on here because I define the Hamiltonian to be minus the original objective. And then down here, I kind of pulled the minus sign out, right? So here I'm actually maximizing over P, whereas before I was minimizing, right? So this is actually, this thing is the dual problem of the, um, of the sort of primal oil Lagrange, sort of Lagrangian problem that we wrote before in optimization terms. In classical mechanics terms, this is called the Legendre transform, where I basically get rid of the Vs and replace them with Ps with momenta. So basically, if I split, swap momentum for velocities in all the equations and get this Hamiltonian set up, it's called going from Lagrangian to Hamiltonian is called the Legendre transform. It's literally equivalent to doing the Lagrange dual in optimization. Uh, cool. I think that's about all there is to say about that. And we're a little over time. Sorry, guys. So uh, we're done for the day.